Welcome back to the Forensic Focus podcast. I'm Krista Miller, and this week, Desi Sai and I are welcoming Dr. Matthew Sorrell, Senior Lecturer at the University of Adelaide School of Electrical and Electronic Engineering in Australia. The university is hosting the upcoming Digital Forensics Research Workshop for the Asia Pacific region, and we're excited for Matthew to be joining us to talk about it. Good G'day, Krista. Welcome. We're, we're so happy to have you here. My pleasure. Yeah. So um, I think most of our listeners are probably familiar with DFRWS, but um, um, and the, the rodeo challenge in particular, I think that's, um, that's going to be a, a, um, a major topic of conversation today. Um, if you could describe for us what it is, what the workshop is, and what's involved uh, with the, the, uh, the workshop and the, and the rodeo. Sure. So uh, health data has become increasingly uh, important now as a, uh, as a source of, uh, of evidence and it's an interesting space because uh, in the digital forensic space, we typically think about digital forensics being about the analysis of logs and files and RAM and effectively in that digital space. Health data is really interesting because it brings our um, physical world into the digital aura. So this is now sensors that are on your watch, that are on your phone, um, that are tracking your movements, that are tracking your behaviours. Um, and bringing that into then a summarized log. Um, it's quite important then that, that we uh, understand the limitations of that. So to just give you one example, uh, Apple Health does things like uh, recording that you climbed a flight of stairs, but that's not quite what it does. Actually, what it says is it uses the barometer to say you've climbed about 10 feet and you've walked about 18 steps. And so therefore I think that you've climbed a flight of stairs. Well, if you're walking through a pressure door into an air-conditioned building, you can trigger a false alarm. So it's important to understand that there are limitations in, in how we can interpret that, that information. So the radio this year um, is being set up by my uh, PhD student, uh, Luke Jennings, and he's using my personal health data, which I started collecting in 2017. And I'll tell you why that date's important in a moment. But basically what I've got is five years of longitudinal data um, across a range of iPhones as I've upgraded over the years, across a range of Apple Watches as I've upgraded over the years, and of course, big changes in iOS and watchOS along the way. So that data set um, gives us a really rich source of diversity. We can see when uh, Apple has fundamentally changed the way in which they've uh, operated the health, uh, health app and so on. Um, but it also highlights just some of the rare anomalies that we sometimes find in that data set. Um, so the uh, rodeo is essentially a CDF based on that data set. And we will also bring some of the associated sets in because there are some things that you can get out of a, an export file that aren't actually captured in that particular um, yeah. database. And um, there's also some really strange anomalies in the exports as well. So really, the, 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 there's two points here, right? One is, one is to find things. And then the second thing is to understand some of those limitations. Um, so we're really excited about that. We're writing at the moment. We're a bit of a mad scramble, but there's some really interesting stuff. Uh, before we do that, we're going to be running a workshop on the Wednesday afternoon, so 28th mm -hmm. of September. And we're basically... For many, of our, for many of our participants, this might be the first time you've actually dived into that database. So, you know, we're going to assume, of course, that you can dive into an SQLite database, but just understanding the structure of it and, and how you can interpret that and how that relates to other, uh, other data as well. One of the really interesting uh, data sets that we found in that, in that uh, health database is, in fact, a record of every phone and every version of iOS and every watch and every version of watchOS is listed, which is interesting because if you then correlate that with your um, health measurements, you get a very accurate feel for uh, when you upgraded your phone, uh, when you upgraded your operating mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. um, we uh, also found that uh, time zones are recorded there. And as far as I'm aware, that's the only place where you get a recording of every time zone the phone records itself as being listed in. So recently when I was reviewing all of my travel, in fact, over the last five years, that was the best place to start because I could see taking off in Adelaide, landing in Doha, 
uh, landing in the UK, coming back. I could see all of those all of those uh, locations. And what's really interesting about that is that it also works um, as you SIM swap um, as you move. You know, if you're buying a prepaid SIM to put into your phone, um, all of that information is captured. So it's a potentially a very rich source of uh, evidence that that we really haven't tapped on. So it, it's it's going to be it's going to be fun. I was just going to say, it sounds really interesting. It was actually the first time I've ever heard what that acronym was when uh, we, we've we set it out for uh, DFRWS. Um, it's definitely something that is new for me. Like I've, I've been in, I guess, cybersecurity for a while, but I have never heard of this conference until I started talking to to Krista in that. So it's something that, that seems really cool. But how long has it been around in APAC for? Uh, so this is actually only the second time we've run it here in the Asia Pacific region. So the, the conference okay. has been around yep. for quite a while. Uh, we were going to be running the first 2020 conference uh, <laughs> alongside the uh, International Association of Forensic Sciences in Sydney and everything was set up mm -hmm. to go. And then of course it got deferred and then it got canceled. Yep. So we ended up running the first okay. conference virtually. So 2020 conference in January, 2021, all right. online. Um, it was, it ended up being a good conference, but it didn't, wasn't a great conference because mm. I think we're all, you know, despite the fact that we're talking on Zoom right now, we're all a bit sick of Zoom. <laughs> um, so I'm really, really looking forward to seeing people for the, you know, for the first time in a long time yeah. in person. Um, the conference, we expect to have around about 50 to 60 people in person here at the University of Adelaide, but okay. we're also going to have 200 to 250, maybe more online. So that's going to change the vibe, right? Mm. And um, I, I'm really looking forward to that. Mm. No, that sounds really cool. And so the, the people that are online will still get a chance to do that, the workshop on the Wednesday afternoon? That'll oh, be run virtually? Absolutely. So uh, uh, funnily enough, as a university, we kind of got used to teaching online and also teaching hybrid. <laughs> so we, we're, yeah. we're pretty good at that now. Um, yeah. So yeah, this is certainly going to be accessible for everybody. Um, nice. Though those of those people who are in person will will be able to do this, you know, on their laptop in the room. Uh, those of you at home will probably have a better uh, setup to be able to do the rodeo. But you don't get the pizza, so you know, <laughs> some you lose, uh, you lose some. Yeah. Although you know you can supply your own beer, however you want to do that. <laughs> So you, you said that there's going to be a workshop, which, uh, you know, sounds fantastic. And then, and then there's a CTF. What, what, yeah. what, what, what's the nature of the CTF? Is, is, it, is it figure out when Mike went for a jog or? Uh... Uh, so there'll be, there'll, there'll be a little bit. Now, um, just to be very clear, it's my personal health data. And th so there's, a, there's an ethics question here around this data, right? Which is mm. I can't hand over a phone to a student and say, go and explore and we'll go and find out where you went. Because not only does that inadvertently capture a lot of their personal information. Um, it may potentially capture information that we don't know about. because It's just something hidden somewhere in the data, in the data set. Um, so I've made an, I made an ethical decision in 2017 that in capturing the data that I needed to capture, I was just going to keep it and I was going to share it to the research community. So that's basically what we're using. So it will literally be where, things like, where did I travel? When did I jog? Um, you know, when did I stop doing any exercise? Oh. Um, <laughs> um, and just exploring that, uh, yeah, and exploring that data set, right? Um, it's, you know, we have a lot of tools for um, breaking into uh, these these uh, databases and, and pulling them out. You know, there's you know, XLYs Examine, there's Magnet Axiom, Celebrite, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's great, but I, I'm a little bit concerned sometimes that they take a few shortcuts in, in what they're interpreting and particularly in how they visualise that data. So uh, what got my interest in this particular data set, in fact, was a murder that occurred here in Adelaide in 2016. Now, you can go and use your Google food, but I'm actually not going to name the, the case, um, but it turned, it, it's public enough. Um, the victim was wearing an Apple Watch. Uh, when she drove her car home, parked the car, turned off the ignition, Bluetooth disconnected, 45 seconds later, walked 20 steps. Then there's a big flurry of activity. And that's and then seven minutes later, we see the last recorded heartbeat. And this was the first example that we're aware of. So late 2016, the first example that we're aware of where 
we actually recorded the process of assault on the victim and the subsequent death of the victim on one of these devices that was admissible. And the, one of the key reasons why it was admissible is because we got no further recordings except that the phone kept logging every minute basal energy. And it kept doing that until 1am and the police arrived on the scene at about 10.30pm. So we've got continuity showing that the phone and the watch continued to work and communicate with each other. So that was really, really important. But it also highlighted that nobody had thought about this. Mm. So around about this time, 2017, I presented that information at an Interpol meeting and a week later, Celebrite and uh, MSAB, XRY's parent company, made sure that they were pulling out the, uh, the health database into their acquisition software and started to do that interpretation. Mm -hmm. So it's nice to have that sort of impact. Um, you know, it's tragic murder, but what we, what we discovered, in fact, is this is a rich source. And up until that time, there hadn't really been a serious push to analyse that health data from a criminal investigation perspective. So I'm... <laughs> Forgive me for being slightly morbid because that's the nature of the case. Um, mm. But I, um, one would assume that Apple has refined the way that they're monitoring for uh, movement to reflect um, things that we normally do, like yep. jog, swim, walk up a flight of stairs, you know, the exceptions to the pressure uh, that, that, you, that you mentioned. How, how has it captured um, and reflected what would have been a set of movements one would suspect that are not normally part of one's day-to-day uh, -day, uh, routine. Were you able to draw any inference out of the way that they had recorded movement or was there just not enough granularity in there to, to do it? So it, it just it, looked it, like, go on, sorry. Yeah, no, so it's, it's, it's an interesting question. In fact, it has changed quite a lot over time. Uh, and, in, and in fact, um, uh, part of answering that question, because it was very much front of mind, was that uh, Luke's PhD work is, is focused on repeatable experiments to where you put a watch or, you know, some other wearable device up to, you know, even a phone onto a rig and we, you know, we make it walk mm. and, and we know how, we know how fast you walk and we know what, you know, what the pace is and how long and how many steps there were. And then we look at the accuracy. Um, and this turns out to be a really, really hard problem because one of the things that happens in the, more con more recent versions of, of Apple Health data is it will count steps in 10 minute intervals. And to get that 10 minute interval to start, you basically have to have a gate that says, okay, you're walking, I'm going to start a walking session. There's usually about an eight to 10 second delay before that actually says, okay, you're walking now. But if you stop walking, but you're ambling, you know, you might be um, shifting around on your feet, but there's enough walking like movement that may still count as steps. Um, and it's really, really hard to, to create a repeatable experiment. And the reason, which is what you alluded to is the watch is built to be fit for a particular purpose, which is an assumption that you're keeping track of your health over the day. So if it says you're walking, there's usually an assumption that you're walking. If it's, if there's, a distance measurement, that's essentially um, the number of steps times the average stride length. That's been updated uh, with, I think, iOS 13, where um, it now actually keeps track of your stride length during the day, and that can vary a bit. Um, so th there's all sorts of changes. So uh, young Luke was up in Queensland with our collaborators and uh, had spent two days collecting data, and then they decided the team decided to go out for lunch and just leave the system running. And before they did that, they just updated everything. And of course they updated at one of those critical junctions where Apple had completely changed the system. So we had two <laughs> days of one minute, 30 seconds, oh. 30 seconds of nothing, one minute, 30 seconds of nothing. And you could see, boom, boom, boom. They came back and all the data set was just, oh, 10 minute intervals, 10 minute intervals, <laughs> 10 minute intervals. <laughs> That was frustrating, but it was also very insightful mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. because you don't get great granularity with step counts. Um, back with the um, original generation um, Apple Watch in late 2016, you did. 
So uh, basal energy. So this is this is the an estimate of how much energy your body's burning uh, just to stay alive. You know, breathing, heartbeat, and so on. It's around about a calorie per minute, or four kilojoules per minute, if you want to work in proper units. Um, that data was recorded in one minute intervals, and the result was that it absolutely dominated the data set. So that's now fifteen minute intervals, and it's not quite as dominating, um, but it's still useful because it tells you since that's recorded, off, it would fact calculated off the watch, it tells you that the watch and the phone are talking to each other. Um, so there's, you know, there's all sorts of um, uh, interesting uh, inferences that you can make from this data, but you can't necessarily say, well, you know, from this particular instance to that particular instance, you took this sort of stride. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's fascinating stuff. As it turned out with this particular person, and I've done this since with another several other cases, you can actually start to see a pattern of life and a, and a, a normal day. Um, a normal day is not quite as obvious as you think though, because it's not even a seven day cycle. Um, but you can see the watches you know, off the wrist and being charged. You can see when somebody gets up, you can see when they've taken it off in the afternoon. Uh, and if that becomes a pattern, then you start to see anomalies in that pattern, um, particularly when you've got suspicious events. Have you seen a, like diving into the, the technical aspect of the watch, have you seen it be more accurate when you have a watch that uh, enables an eSIM to be used with it versus one that's Wi-Fi and Bluetooth enabled that has to pair with a phone because it has that connectivity the whole time? Um, we haven't really examined that aspect in, in a great deal of detail, but one of the things mm. that does happen as a result of being on an eSIM is that your health data off the watch can be uploaded to cloud to iCloud. Yeah. So if you're yeah. uh, so if you're you if you enable iCloud in that in that mode, then rather than transferring straight from watch to phone, it now goes watch to iCloud to phone. Um, mm. So it's not so much a question of accuracy as a question of latency back into the, back into the phone system. Um, What's really interesting, of course, is that the, the Apple ecosystem for health data is very much contained on the phone and the watch. The eSIM-enabled phones, uh, as you know, are both connected to the cellular network and, and have GPS enabled. Mm -hmm. I'm not particularly concerned about the GPS on, on the watch at this stage. I want to talk about GPS in a minute about in a different context. Mm -hmm. uh, but what we do find is that all it really does uh, is include iCloud then in necessarily into the ecosystem so when you're when you're exercising and wearing a watch and not carrying a phone of course the data is buffered on your on your on your watch um, but it can also be relayed via um, iCloud into the phone um, mm -hmm. which is useful if you go missing and we've just got your phone left behind so there's mm -hmm. there's some it's, there's some useful aspects to that um, what's really interesting from my perspective with with uh, the Apple health ecosystem is that by default, it's just on the phone and the watch. Um, iCloud backup, if you want it, uh, certainly you can do an encrypted backup and, and recover it from there as well. Um, but it's not being pushed into somebody else's server unless you want it to. Mm. If you compare that with something like Fitbit, um, Fitbit will, will log for a lot, lot longer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think seven days of, of uh, uh, um, buffer. But when you upload, your phone is just is just a relay. It relays it yeah. into into the cloud somewhere, and it back comes a summary, and all you see on your phone is a summary. And now I mm. I don't I don't know what Fitbit's doing with my data, but I guarantee you that it's probably probably on the edge of of uh, privacy, <laughs> because yeah, they're looking no no they're, they're they're yeah they're looking for uh, you know they're, they're looking for patterns and they're looking to improve their product. Yeah. Um, mm. So that bit's mm. interesting. Now I do want to talk about GPS because you know whether the GPS is in your phone or it's in your watch. Core mo uh, core location is not GPS. It, it's it, GPS is just one of the inputs that your phone uses for location, mm. right? It's uh, if you happen to be outdoors and you happen to be able to synchronize to four or five satellites or more, then you might get a GPS location which gives you an accuracy in the order of about ten feet. Um, or three meters, if you want to use real units. Um, normally, you know, let's call let's call that 10, 20, 30 meters. Pretty much, that's what you get with the jitter variation that you find uh, 
with a GPS or a, a GNSS system. And it could be Galileo, of course, or these other uh, systems as well, depending on the chipset and the version of the phone. But Apple does a couple of other things as well. If you're indoors, it will look for Wi-Fi beacons. If you're mm. outdoors and it can't get a lock on GPS, it may be able to use crowdsource data on Wi-Fi, you know, something like Wiggle, and decide that you're halfway down the road because mm. somebody drove up your street, saw your Wi-Fi access point and decided that that's a good location to say, all right, I can see that particular Wi-Fi access point. Mm. Um, and failing that, it'll just say, well, I can see this cell, so therefore I'm just going to place it on where I believe that that uh, that cell um, connects to. Mm. That's great. A lot of the tools will give you the latitude and longitude, but they won't give you the estimated accuracy. And if they right. yeah. do give you the estimated, because the, 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 the cache database, the geolocation cache, doesn't tell you the source. It just gives you the answer. Right. And one of the issues there is that once you hit 500 feet, 165 meters, um, it just says, I don't care anymore. Right? 165 meters is close enough. Right? It, 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 you're, you're, you're there or you're more. Right? Um, and you can see that because if you look at that data in, a, in an urban area, so a conurbation area, houses are just down the street and most houses have Wi-Fi and that's accurate enough. If you're in a semi-rural mm -hmm. area, Right, you've got a Wi-Fi access point, but you can see it across a field. Yeah, you got some acreage. 400, 500 meter away. Yeah, 500, 500 meters away, and it just yeah. says 165 meters. It's a little bit crazy, right? Interesting. Because yeah. to to understand that, you have to understand radio propagation, and that's not in the usual toolkit for most digital forensic investigators. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, and for me, it is. It's, it's the stuff that I have been teaching for over twenty years. So. Mm. That's kind of in the bag. Um, yeah, so uh, it, it concerns me then when you've got, a, yeah, let's name a product. Celebrite goes and says, it's case database. Therefore, that must be a GPS fix. It's like, mm. No, no. By labeling it that, you've made it really misleading and you've misled investigators because you haven't incorporated the yeah. broader knowledge of what that is. Yeah. So I guess that's like, I think um, the big question that's coming up for me right now, um, here you talk about this is, is this is a lot of data and, you know, you've mentioned homicide and missing persons and, and um, I mean, what are, are those the, the main categories of cases that, um, that this is going to be applied to? Because like, I mean, for, for, you know, general, I want to say everyday cases, but um, I guess lesser, <laughs> lesser the, the crimes. Hypothesis, the hypothesis yeah. that I suggested was, can we tell if somebody's running away from the scene of a robbery, actually? I think mm. so. No, right, you know. right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, so the, the answer to your question is that, you know, for most, for, have a look at mobile phone forensics from say 20 years ago, which was pull out the SIM, which contains your uh, uh, address list, your phone contact list, and your last 20 SMS messages, right? And you go, okay, great. Extracting the SIM is really useful. And the phone is basically just a shell. And now what have you got? You've got basically a battery powered, very powerful handheld computer full of sensors, all of which mm. are being logged to some extent. And it's a pattern of life recorder and you're just carrying it around, right? Now, for many cases, it is very straightforward because you've got text messages and photos talking about the drug deal. I don't get involved in those cases. I don't need to. That's really straightforward. Um, and as a consequence, I, I have a bias. And the bias is that I only see the cases where uh, law enforcement basically say, we're not quite sure what this means and how to deal with it. Yeah. So... Um, uh, on the one hand, that means that, yes, I have a biased view. On the other hand, it means I get all the interesting cases. And mm -hmm. so that does tend to be in the major crime, the homicides, missing yeah. persons side. It is also in some of the organised crime space and um, um, just other other weird and bizarre ones, you know, things like uh, putting trackers on vehicles, for example, um, where you want to be able to show that, our suspect at some point travelled with the tracker, right, mm -hmm. and being able to mm -hmm. correlate that through. Um, so to give you another really weird anomaly, right, um, mobile network will tell you, uh, old school, will tell you start time and end time of a phone call. 
And along with that, it will identify start cell and end cell. And in a plain old telephone system, GSM, 3G, voice communication, that's pretty robust because it's all captured in the one place. But now what have we got? We've got voice over LTE and we've got data sessions that are not three minute phone calls, but four and a half hour data sessions. And one of the things we realized was that in fact, what you've got is a start time for a data session and an end time for a data session. And then you've got a cell location that says, this is the first cell on this session where data was transferred. And this is the last cell during this session where data was transferred. And that's not necessarily at the start time and the end time, mm. right? Mm -hmm. And there are, there are even bigger anomalies than that, which I won't go into because they're, they're fascinating, but it will take too long. Um, but being able to understand that, um, I've had a recent case, for example, uh, and I know Desi, you're here in, here in Adelaide, but it was across, across the Spencer Gulf, right? And so I had uh, suspects in and around Port Wakefield and then 50 kilometres away in Ardrossan on the other side of a body of water, I've suddenly got this phone connecting and then breaking out again. And you go, well, that's mm. really weird. Unless you're a radio engineer, in which case, you know, actually that's a really common occurrence when you've had a hot day and a cold night and you've got a temperature inversion and radio signal just bounces up and down on the warm air, right? At which point you go, oh, we know this. That's easy. Now you've got to explain it to a court. <laughs> so it's uh, that that's oh, so that's well. the fun space. So I mean, I guess where I'm coming from is I don't come from a computer science background. I don't come into digital forensics from a cybersecurity background. I have that background. You know, I've been programming since 1978. You know, my first computer, which is still in my office, it still works. It was an Exidy Sorcerer, and I've still got the tapes and the tape deck. Um, <laughs> It's just so much magic, right? So don't dump any any Z80 machine code at me because I'll probably be able to execute it in my head. It's that sort of <laughs> that sort of era. Um, so I kind of have that background, but what I really have is the electronics background, the signal processing, the radio frequency engineering, mm -hmm. uh, the sensor background. And if you understand that really well, it brings a different dimension to uh, the forensic investigation of digital evidence because it's come from the real world mm. yeah <laughs> so what was it that actually drew you into you know um apple iWatches as, as an analysis then i mean if you're a radio uh specialist uh, yeah, geek i was yeah. gonna say but i didn't want to be offensive <laughs> okay if you're a radio right, yeah. geek um <laughs> geek why, is fine yeah, yeah, why, geek why is why a badge of honor okay excellent. okay yeah <laughs> let me ask you a question actually so um i I st I've been an academic now for 20 years. I came from a background first in radar and then in telecommunications. I found radar bored me silly. Telecommunications was the same toolkit with a slightly different question. Did a lot of commercial work. Entered into academia and in about 2006, I was asked to comment on some digital photographs in a fairly unpleasant case. And we realized there was no science behind examin examination of EXIF metadata, which was new, or digital cameras, which was new. Um, so that sort of started a fascination in recognising there was a gap here that wasn't being addressed properly because it was coming from a, from a perspective of computer science when, in fact, we were dealing with sensors. Um, you know, so this is about the era of sensor pattern noise, Jessica Friedrich's work in that space and Haney Farad getting into that space, uh, which is terrific work, but there's a certain level of naivety about it. I don't say that unkindly, naivety about it because they're not, they don't have a background in signal processing and statistical signal processing, which is necessary to work in that space. Um, so that started an interest in looking at devices, cameras in this case, as evidence. One of the early things that I did uh, was that I got my all of my colleagues with their newfangled digital cameras to give me a whole bunch of photos. And I just wanted to strip the metadata out and see how different manufacturers um, implemented JPEG. And one of the things I found was that uh, two camera manufacturers had identical JPEG structures. They had the same uh, quantization matrices, they had the same structure. And I raised this with one of the manufacturers. I said, you realize that, you know, your competitors doing the same thing as you. And they went, oh, that's very strange. We don't understand why. And six months later, the competitor actually admitted, 
yeah, we were so far behind the eight ball that uh, we kind of stole some intellectual property. <laughs> sorry. Um, <laughs> so that was kind of interesting. Um, I, I'm not sure that my work triggered that admission, but it certainly identified it before it was public. So that was kind of interesting as well. Fast forward to 2016 and South Australia police came to the university and said, um, so we've got this problem. We've had this murder. We've identified a watch. We've got exported data from it. Um, and, and we want to understand with how, how it's calibrated. And one of the key issues here is that the data that had been exported was off by an hour. It was an hour. It was an hour out. Now it turns out, Here's another little secret from our workshop in a couple of weeks time, right? Um, you've got the SQLite database in the Health DB Secure. All of the data, all of the um, timestamps are recorded in Apple Cocoa Core, so they're all UTC based. So far, so good. There's a detailed list of time zones that the phone is working in. So far, so good. However, from the app, from the Health app, if you do an export. Export takes a shortcut and it says whatever time zone you're in right now is the time zone for all of the data that I'm exporting. Oh, daylight savings. Yeah. This particular murder yeah. happened on Friday, the 30th of September. Oh. Right? <laughs> Sunday morning was daylight savings. This data <laughs> was extracted the next Tuesday. Oh. Right. So, um, <laughs> So, you know, recognizing why something might be and then mm. having, you know, so the result of that is that I had this watch and phone switched off for a long time while we got another watch and phone and went, right, how does this behave? And that was really critical to do so that when mm. I did finally turn it on and we discovered that actually there's a whole, much, whole bunch more data in there than the export file tells you. Um, uh, and that, so that was really interesting. However, one of the things that happens now when you do an export is it will also, for example, show the route of, a, of a, an exercise routine. So if you've gone for a walk or a jog or a run around your, around your area, that map will show up there. Mm. It may, it, it, we haven't really found it inside the, the health data at this stage. It's probably there, right? We do know where the start location is recorded in the health data, um, but we can't easily pull the map out. Um, it, it can be done, I guess, but we don't need to because now part of our routine would be do a, do a data export before you image, right? Mm. By doing that, you've actually got that data then easily accessible when you do your export, if it's necessary. Um, that then raises a really interesting question around evidence handling, right? Mm. So if you think about conventional computer forensics, which is essentially, all right, I've got a hard drive, and I've got a right blocker and I'm going to make a bit image copy before mm. I do anything. Right now, a couple of problems with that. First is that if you've got a stack of two terabyte drives, you don't know which one to do first. And you spend all of your time just basically imaging before you even start doing analysis. So some sort of triage is necessary, but you can't do that with a phone. With a phone, you have to go in through, the front door. Sometimes you have to break down the front door to go through the front door. So some, you know, some sort of side loader, but you've still, you're requesting files out of the file system. As a consequence, it's a live unit. So what do you do at a crime scene? If you pick up, a, if you pick up an iPhone, uh, the accelerometers will trigger. Right? Um, you know, the, there's a whole bunch of evidence handling here, which is necessarily going to, add to the data set. Mm. So a really interesting research question then is, well, what's acceptable and what's not? Right? Um, what, sort of, what sort of actions can you take at the crime scene that are visible so that you can actually say that layer of dirt there is triage at the crime scene and everything under here is still wholesome and uncorrupted? Mm -hmm. right? And you have to think about it in that way. Even if you've got the most perfectly trained crime scene um, examiners, right? Just evidence handling there. Mistakes will happen. Mm. Um, but also deliberate things will happen. Or um, there'll be a decision made that accessing this phone here will save a life. Even if it's at the cost of the evidence. 
And mm. so being able to quantify and qualify what that means, it's a really, really uncomfortable conversation to have with uh, classically trained digital investigators because mm. you very much see it as can't corrupt the evidence, can't corrupt the evidence, right? Mm. In actual fact, you ha- what you have to be able to do is contain the evidence. Mm. Uh, are you involved in training first responders in that regard? Um, not that so much the first responders at this stage. I very much focus my attention on analytics. So essentially, we've got the data. Um, in particular, I consider that uh, the digital forensics technicians, the e-crime units that do the extraction, you know, I, I have a kit. I can do extraction, right? But I'm a civilian. So that's going to that's going to corrupt chain of evidence and police procedures. So I'd much rather the expertise be built and remain and stay active amongst the first responders. Certainly, I can contribute to that discussion, and I've done that through a, a European project called Four Mobile, which we've released a standard. Uh, I'm sure I can give you a link to that if you want to post that as part of the blog. Um, but um, where I do a lot of training now is in analytics. So what does this database mean? How do we interpret it? What is it? How do we use it? The way I run that at the, at the university is there's a university version, which is um, a little bit sensitive, but not really sensitive. And then there's the version that I teach into law enforcement where we can use much more recent uh, data and have more of a, a, a quiet conversation. Um, so the student version, the way we teach that analytics is we start with a case we using uh, cellular network data and, and we track movements of suspects. So we have a case, it's a real case. We've sanitized the data and got approval to use it. Part of that then is the students have to write an expert witness report that's, that's of the standard that it can be used in court. Now for technical people, that's a real challenge, right? <laughs> Because you have to step back and say, this is what the evidence says, as opposed to this is what I think happened. Mm. Right? So it's hard. So we, we do that. The second part of that is we had some fun. I handed out a bunch of phones to, to some students and some family members. And over a period of months, we had uh, people having various conversations about cats. Now, cats, as it turns out, the not safe for work discussion, right? Um, and then there's there's an incident as a result of which, for some magic reason, all the phones are brought in and imaged. And um, in the process of analysing that data, we discover that there's a group of people selling, trading, growing catnip. <laughs> okay, that's kind of interesting. Um, and then along the way, we discover that someone who has, has a little bit of a, a purient interest in ducks, right? So... It's a little bit of fun, but it's also a serious message, right? And mm. when you've got a multidisciplinary team taking that course, you have different specializations coming to the fore as to what you look for. So some of that is about messages and images. Some people are deep diving into the health data or um, in, in one case, I had, a, I had a student who knew a little bit more about jailbreaking iPhones. And since it was his iPhone, he decided to jailbreak it and go deeper, which was... A great thing to do. We also had a, a, a cheap feature phone that I bought at my local petrol station, um, which, and I'm not going to give you the brand. The reason is it's a great burner phone because you can't get in, you can't break the Android front end. Um, but one of my students did find out how to do a backup and then did a bin walk, managed to extract the data. Now that took four or five days to do that. Oh, wow. But it was great because no one had done it before. Mm. Um, and, um, a little bit of social engineering, I believe, associated with that too, because he'd found somebody in New Zealand where that brand of phone is um, also sold and yeah. uh, po- posed, as a, posed as a girl and chatted this particular hacker up and <laughs> got the data. <laughs> so, you know, we did some awesome, a bit of social engineering as well. Um, <laughs> so what we do with that report, though, is the students then get to present their evidence as a group in moot court. There is so much data there that they have to break it up, work as a team, answer different questions, and then present the evidence. And for university students, that's enormously insightful to see this is what your work means. Right? Mm. So um, what we're now doing is we're building a curriculum that is a little bit more than the conventional digital forensics, right? Because conventional digital forensics really comes down to very competent technical skills, right? 
investigation of digital evidence requires much deeper analytical skills. And mm -hmm. so being able to teach that is really hard to do, but really, really necessary. Mm -hmm. um, you know, digital evidence load is now a significant 30 to 40% of the total forensic evidence that you'll pick up at a crime scene, whether that's phones, CCTV, wearable devices, vehicle, you know, engine management units, um, ent entertainment head units, etc. cetera. Um, you know, there is just so, we, we leave so much data, you know, coming from our, you know, the aura, the digital aura that we have around us just gets left behind. Um, and it tells us a lot. And, you know, for people who think, okay, that's a bit big brother, keep in mind that just as often that will um, be exculpatory. Mm -hmm. right? um, my favourite example of that, in fact, was a parking ticket that I got last year from the City Council. Said, you parked here for too long, right? I said, but I've got a valid ticket. And I said, yes, but you were here at 10.30 in the morning. And I went, well, hang on. I've got my Google Maps, I've got my credit card receipts, and I've got CCTV at my home. Now, um, we haven't mentioned this, but one of the little jobs that I have is that I'm the Honorary Consul of the Republic of Estonia here in Adelaide. So my house is a consulate. So we have CCTV. It is very carefully maintained, and I don't muck about. Now, it took 11 weeks for the council to admit that maybe they got the identity of the car wrong. But all of that work, you know, the hours of work, that got me out of a $76 fine. So I was really, really <laughs> pleased with, with that return on that investment. In all Fantastic. honesty, the greatest achievement there is that you got the council to admit that they were wrong. Oh, yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, and, and I managed to do it without outing them publicly. Oh, hang on. Damn. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I want to bring this all back to DFRWS. Um, how is the a tremendous amount of work and, and um, 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 it sounds like quality here. How is that going into the workshop and the rodeo um, in particular? Like how is that? Well, I guess what can participants of the rodeo expect from, um, from the scenario that you're building? Okay. So funnily enough, it, it's not really a specific, scenario you're not solving a case what you're really doing is diving into my pattern of life right so it's a little bit okay. different in that regard right yeah you've yeah. got you've got well as part of the training for this we'll just give you a short burst of data that you know you can handle because it's only going to you know baby be a meg um my health database right now is i think around uh, 570 megabytes so um it's it's a non-trivial SQLite database now to deal with. Um, I mean, you can still deal with it on a desktop computer. So we're not talking huge data, but it's enough. Um, so part of that is finding little artifacts. And then as we progress, we want you to start telling the story about what I do. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that's um, gets a little bit more involved, requires you to start cross linking things and, and, and looking through and, and drawing some inferences from that data. Um, but really we want, we want our participants to, to dive into that database and the associated um, databases linking into the health data and say, actually, there's more in here if you care to look. Um, you have to think about accuracy and so on. Mm -hmm. um, so that and that and so the workshop really is an introduction to, to some of those tools. Uh, then there'll be a, a, a practice uh, data set. The rodeo itself is a little bit more of a, a uh, a longer CTF and of course yeah. working across time zones uh, will make that available for 24 hours um, nice. so that you know people have a chance to play with it uh, and of course I'm making that data set available to the, the research community. Um, all I ask of people is that if you are going to use it and publish a paper about it is one acknowledge where it's come from and secondly don't publish my address. Right? <laughs> it's, it's, it's in the data. Um, it's not that hard to find, but I don't really want it, you know, in an IEEE transactions um, <laughs> journal. Um, uh, fair. Yeah. <laughs> Look, we, we've so we've got four workshops happening. Uh, Claude Rue from the, from Sydney is talking about the Sydney Declaration. So this is really about um, revisiting the science behind forensic science, and we want to address that in digital forensics because it concerns me that it's missing. Right? We, uh, we, we put a lot of technical effort into things like ensuring the integrity of files, you know, so signing and hashing and um, 
processes for chain of evidence and right blocking and so on. Great. I totally respect that we need to do that. But where's the science that says when this log occurs, these are the circumstances under which it occurs and these are the circumstances un under mm. which it might also occur, right? Um, and that's a really non-trivial um, space to think about. But we have to think about it because if we're going to convict people on the basis of digital evidence, we have to put our hand on our heart and say, we know this because we did this science as opposed to, I reckon it's this because I'm an expert. I don't think that's a, that's a good enough response. Mm -hmm. So that's the Sydney Declaration. Mm -hmm. Michael Kahn's going to talk about Velociraptor. Uh, Harm Van Beek from the Netherlands Forensics Institute is going to talk about digital forensics as a service. Mm -hmm. So we've got a great lineup there. Um, Amongst our keynotes, we've got Harm again, but we've also got Yuval Yaron, who's a, a professor here at the University of Adelaide. He's one of the guys that uh, basically broke Intel uh, a couple of years ago with uh, side channel attacks. So he's going to talk about how, how that's come together. Um, so uh, some really, really interesting work there. A um, bunch of other papers, quite a diverse range of, of topics uh, from you know, cloud and network forensics through to computers and live RAM extraction and so on. Um, through to, you know, a couple of papers that, that I've pr produced with my uh, my young colleague, Richard Matthews, my PhD student who uh, took cameras into the CMOS world. He's done a whole bunch of stuff scraping uh, SnapMap. And so uh, a really interesting topic for him was back in 2020, you might remember the, mm -hmm. the riots in Minneapolis and Paul. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, what he did is he used his snap map scraper and he just collated whatever video and images he could find. And then he curated them and just published them on Twitter. So he had a tool that did it, grab it. Right? We got an email from somebody living in Minneapolis and Paul saying, thank you, because at three o'clock in the morning, you were the only news source that told us whether it was safe to leave the house. Oh, wow. Wow. So yeah. it's, it's nice to have that impact. Right, mm -hmm. um, and you know, terrific achievement for young Richard to be able to develop that sort of tool. Um, and yeah, and we're automating that now so that we can actually scrape that. And of course, you stick it on Snap that it is public, so it's actually quite ethical, we're not breaking really mm. anything. Um, it is open source, so you know, re really impressive little tool. So, we're going to talk about that as well. Nice, excellent, fantastic. For something that I've just learned what the acronym means, I'm very excited for all these talks. <laughs> I Although don't, see don't ask me what the acronym means because I've forgotten it already. Oh, no. no look, I worked in the FFRWS. So I still don't know. That's a digital forensics research workshop, but there we, we just call it the FFRWS nice. because, you know, we, we've moved on. This conference is designed to bring academics and practitioners and law enforcement together and actually yeah. talk about real problems. It's very focused on the real um, uh, and that's absolutely critical because that's mm. that's how we translate research into action. Yeah, the one yeah. the one that we did in uh, in Oxford fairly well fairly recently it was this year, which is nice. Mm. Um, but yeah, you're right. We had a we had a really good mix of of practitioners and and law enforcement and academics, and it was great to sit actually sit down at lunch and and, and speak with different people from from the Netherlands and uh, and the UK and and, and various other academics and. Uh, yeah, no, it was fascinating. And it is a really good sort of uh, group of people to get together. So um, I'm really excited for you. And I'll be um, looking up some of these things afterwards, um, yeah. depending upon what time zone I'm actually sitting in when it's all going on. <laughs> so, um, Fantastic. So it's not too late to register, dfrws.org. Just look up the APAC 2022 uh, program. Uh, Desi, since you're local, we may even see you there. Right? Definitely, so yeah. I'm I'm definitely... planning on being there. Yeah, fantastic. So that's that's going to be great. Um, and the sessions I'll will just, be recorded yeah. as well. Sorry, Matthew, but I, I want yeah. to note that as well that the, the you know because it's a hybrid yeah. that the sessions are being recorded. So anybody that is unable to make it uh, will yeah. still be able to view them online later. So. That's right. So look, if if you're registered, you can either watch it live or you can watch it on playback because you know time zones. Um, but um, it, it will be recorded and we will make some of those those recordings available after the fact as well. So yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, yeah, the, the, the time zone issue, always the tricky one. Um, and uh, just, you know, to add insult to injury, South Australia is in a half hour time zone. Oh, wow. Uh, think, I mean, yeah, that's really <laughs> unusual. It's like, well, so, <laughs> so, 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 like right. 
So is India, right? So it's actually, yeah. you know, in terms of total world population, it's not that unusual. But um, <laughs> it, it, it is, it is, is unusual because if you fly out of Adelaide and you're wearing an Apple Watch and it's looking at your um, uh, active, you know, number of stand hours, for example, and then you land in, say, I don't know, Qatar, your watch will get very confused because it's doing everything on the half hour and then it does it on the hour and then you end up with, an, with a day that has like 36 hours in it. Oh, and so there's weird, there's weird stuff that happens. Even, even within Australia, I reckon the weird one would be if you flew from South Australia when daylight savings was turning off to Brisbane, which doesn't have daylight savings, and you flip the full hour over Brisbane because we just shift either side of them because of that half hour difference. Oh, I get this all the time, right? I have, you know, part of my class, I have two whole lectures on one of them. One of them's called It's About Time and the other one's called The Order of Things. Um, one of our networks in Australia, right? All of the <laughs> mobile networks operate off UTC, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Of course it does, right? Except for one of our networks, which decided when they launched in Australia that they were going to run everything off Eastern Standard Time. Is that Vodafone? I, it just feels, I, feels I, like I, I, I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> you, may not be, you may not be incorrect. Right? <laughs> it, uh, this time zone known as voter time. Um, but the result of that <laughs> is precisely that. When you've got a data set that crosses a, 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 a boundary of daylight savings, yeah. you've got to remember to add instead of subtract half an hour. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And you know, it's a subtlety, but you've got to mm. know. Right. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes, of course, what's occurring is at 2 a.m. on a Sunday morning. And so then you've mm -hmm. got to be really careful. Yeah. Now, interesting enough, all of that data comes in Excel spreadsheets. Right. <laughs> do you know how to um, do calculations around daylight savings in an Excel spreadsheet? Unfortunately, I do. Yeah. Because uh, <laughs> I had to do it a lot. And yeah. I used to get spreadsheets all the time where it would also come in spreadsheets with no time zone indicated. Yeah. So then it would be testing to figure out which time zone it was in. Yes. Uh, unfortunately, I've, I've dealt with the I, pain. I can't, I can't wait to have you as a, as a student. In the classroom. <laughs> no, yeah, that's, ex that's exactly right. Um, you know, I have, I have a big spit about Excel, right? Unfortunately, it's the least worst tool to use. The least worst meaning that <laughs> investigators who are not digital investigators have a, a Windows set up on their desktop. So they've got Excel and the data, the only thing you look at it in is Excel. Oh, yeah. Excel is the greatest, Excel is the greatest uh, DFIR tool ever made, isn't it? Microsoft didn't even plan on making it. Well, what, what I love is that they deliberately introduced a time bug in, in its first inception so that it would um, be compatible with Lotus 123 um, <laughs> back in the early 80s. So Lotus, Lotus made an assumption that 1900 was a leap year. Ah, and it okay. wasn't. So the dates are off by one. Right. And um, Microsoft deliberately. Now, try this at home, kids. Create a list, numbers one to 90, right? And then format that to be a date. Hmm. And you'll, you'll get, in fact, go zero to 90, and you'll get some really, really weird results around about... Um, um, fifty nine, sixty. I could see size doing that right. Yeah, yeah, now. doing it right now. <laughs> All right, I've, I'm going to do it as soon as this is over. Right. Um, time, time stats are an absolute bugbear for me. Right. You know, if you dive into some of the uh, iOS databases, you've got databases that have Cocoa Core and Unix epoch timestamps. Mm. Right. Now they're seconds away from their epoch, as you, as everyone. On this podcast knows Unix Epoch, 1st of January, 1970. Apple Cocoa Core, 1st of January, 2001. And they're in the same table. <laughs> Different columns, same table. Pick one, guys. Pick one. <laughs> Honestly. They can't even pick their, their charging cables for their phones. They're not going to be able to pick a, a timestamp, that's for sure. I, I, love, I, love that the, I love that the EU has decided to go with USB-C. My advice to everybody is go and invest in the tools for picking lint out of USB-C USB <laughs> cables because it's going to be a huge market. If you've got kids with a, with a, um, a MacBook, you already know this problem because you've spent hours 
picking that lint out of the socket. <laughs> uh, um, it's just, uh, it, it, technologically, it's great. Mechanically, yeah, not so much. <laughs> well, I think we're going to wrap it there. Um, Matthew, thank you so much again for making the time joining us on the Forensic yeah. Focus podcast today. Yeah, thank you, Matthew. Great great Thanks, Matthew. My, That's my nice pleasure. Too. Yeah. Thanks also to our listeners. You'll be able to find this recording and transcription along with more articles, information, and forums at www.forensicfocus.com. Stay safe and well.